Good, awesome. So welcome to the, again, to the fifth day of the workshop. Um, and the workshop page, uh, we are at June 3rd. It's a Wednesday, apparently. So first part of the workshop, I'll be teaching documentation. Then later on, Thor is gonna join us for Jupiter or Jupiter. Um, I always mispronounce that. Now, I have the odd task of make, making people uh, interested in documentation, which is not an easy task to do, believe me. It's, it's dreaded by many and yet it's still useful and required by many as well. So we are here. If you go to the page, the workshop page, and you click on documentation, you'll see the uh, schedule for today. So we're gonna start with a small motivation and wish list. We're gonna uh, use the hackpad to make it a bit more interactive and answer some questions or some um, thoughts you have about documentation. Then we're gonna briefly explore some popular tools and solutions. And after that, we're gonna use one of the tools uh, and solutions in practice, meaning Sphinx and restructured text. And then we're gonna see how to deploy the Sphinx documentation to read the docs. Um, we'll probably not have time for hosting homepages on or websites on GitHub, but we can see where we're at and maybe briefly address it. And after that, we have some discussions about the exercises and some feedback from you. Hopefully this sounds good. Um, and I'm gonna jump right into it in the, in the interest of time. So, as I said, I have an odd task about making people interested in documenting their code. So far in the fifth day, well, almost towards the end of the workshop, uh, we have seen how to commit our code, track our changes, and do a lot of other things in, uh, with our code. Um, but I think what's still important is, um, or what's still important and required by many is the documentation. Because every time you see a, a source code, you just try to wrap your hands around it and try to figure out what this code means. So, We'll try to explore in this in this workshop why we need to document our code, what is a good documentation, and how to actually do it. Now, let's do a small, small. Um, I, this there's no icebreakers, but let's do a small exercise in the main room. So in the hackpad, um, what is good project documentation? Uh, why is it important? Uh, how would you describe useful documentation? How would you motivate your colleagues to actually write documentation? Let's, let's briefly brainstorm about it. Let's give it, I don't know, a few minutes. Um, okay, I think we have pretty good uh, Get a good idea of what you expect about documentation. Yeah, this is this is a nice comment. The better documentation, the less amount of uh, people ask basic questions about the code. That that's that's actually a fair point. Um, has possible use example. That's also a good point. Uh, concise. Something you hardly find. Yes, that's that's also a fair point. So. All of these seem like very, very good uh, points about documentation. And I strongly encourage you to write more um, what you think good, good documentation would look like, or if your project is documented and why, why documentation is important to it. So, um, what do we think about this? Or, or, my personal view on documentation is that um, if you just write about your code and maybe just do Git and track the versions and use Git and track the versions, you will probably know how to search for past things of the, in the code. But if you want to find the reasoning behind what happened in the code, it's very difficult to come back to it. Moreover, if it's not your code. 
uh, that is that's it's a task, a task next to impossible uh, because understanding some sometimes the reasoning behind uh, some changes in the code uh, of another person's codes it's it's very difficult so it's good uh, to keep documentation as close to the code as possible is you might want others users to uh, people to use your code so a first thing to do when people see your repository or code that you published online is look to see if there are any examples any code any any uh, documentation related to that code so they can just start using it and figure out what it is about um, you might want others to contribute so you might want to guide other other people how you contribute to your to your uh, to your code and not to make suggestions like use this style guide or use that style guide so um, you would guide them how to to go about your code and suggest changes and of course as someone else suggested limit limit the amount of uh, frequently asked questions about the code so that's also uh, one of the motivation behind writing the documentation but moreover moreover one uh, good documentation and one good reason for having documentation is just being able to uh, come back to it and point to it and making people aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it and how to start using your project. Now, we don't like to point fingers, so what should be good documentation or bad, so we're going to use our, some of our own examples in, um, in, the, in the documentation. So let's take a look at some repositories here, what could be what they do in terms of documentation. So this is Richard. So what did he do in terms of documentation? Uh, well, first of all, just looking at the repository, I, I just see one small note here. So community detection, utilize analysis, manipulation, detection. That's, that's fair, um, but I don't see a readme. I just see a folder that is doc. So probably right out of the bat, it's missing some, um, some, some important details about, about, the, about the, what this project is about how you can work with it and moreover well, how can I use it I can I start utilizing it so and if I really really want to use it I could just start going into the code but yeah there is some documentation here sorry to interrupt you Stefan but can you zoom in a little bit oh yeah sorry I forgot about that my bad um, is this better yeah okay Okay, um, so this is one project. Uh, sorry, Richard, I don't mean to point fingers. <laughs> uh, I, I sometimes do the same, so. Uh, uh, let's go with another one, which is Cubicle. So this is a small project. The only documentation I see here is uh, this one. And the link that points me to some continuous integration tool. So if I guess what this project is about, I have no idea. I just know it's licensed under BSD tree. So it has no usage examples. Um, and I have to go inside the source code to figure out what it does. And if you want to just start using a project, that's not ideal um, for someone to do. Now let's see another one. Um, this America integ integration grid for molecules. Well, this is quite, this has documentation and it's pretty, pretty nice. It's even well structured. It has a table of contents. So, uh, in, in all, overall, this is pretty good. So contributors who altered it, acknowledgements. So this is a pretty good, um, when installation instructions. So this is one fortunate case of how to, how to do good documentation. So yeah, you can even think of your own projects, how you, how you document them. Um, and with regards to that, and what do you think would be suitable to have good documentation? Uh, what to have, what will be? good documentation from your standpoint. 
would it be tutorials, how to guide explanations, references, um, and just having a small readme, installation instructions, um, so on and so forth. Well, that, the short answer is depends because it depends what you're, what you're doing with the, your source code. If it's a tutorial, you want to have step by instructions. If, you, if you're doing something that is, uh, you need to install, then you need to how to guide, how to install it and how to use it. If you're doing something a bit more research oriented, then you need some explanations attached to it. Uh, and of course, referencing it because how people can reference your code, how they can utilize it and how they can specify or they can reference it in their papers and maybe they should, should point out there what version they should reference. They use utilized uh, to, uh, to run some, uh, to run that uh, source code. So it depends, that's the short answer. You sometimes want a combination of these, of these, uh, of these things in order to uh, to write good documentation um, and with that i think it's it's a good idea to have an understanding of what you would like to see in documentation uh, what is your wish list to see in documentation and think of it think of some of the repositories you have seen in practice and or some of your own repositories and what you would like to document there what would be a wish list to, to document your own repository? So let's do a small exercise in the, in the hackpad. And what would be our wish list here at, um, here from the code refiner standpoint? Um, is this okay? Yeah. So first and foremost, it's a good idea to track the version. So be as specific as you can about the version because it is important to reference it and to keep the document, uh, documentation specific to a certain version in order to enable reproducibility. Um, if, even more so if you have major changes from one version to the other. Um, keep a change log of what happened from one version to the other in order to track the uh, the clear the clear the differences between versions. Documentation should be placed as close as possible to the source code, and we'll see the, this how to do this uh, how to do this in the next um, um, hours. Um, it's often and it's often you're right. It's often good enough to have a, just a small readme at the top of the script uh, describing. Uh, what it or the top of the source code and describing what it is about as most of you pointed out. Use a standard markup language. If you're using PDF or I don't know Excel or DocX or anything, that's kind of a heavy format. And most of the source code repositories uh, that are online like GitHub or GitLab auto automatically or automatically know how to read markdown or um, restructure text syntax and they can format it for you in a nice manner. Or they can even read uh, some more complex uh, formats like uh, Jupyter notebooks and so on and so forth. But the base, the base um, idea is if you have a standard formatting, it's, it's easier to, to work with to make changes and overall for people to follow. Um, and this also translates into making it copy pastable because copy pasting from a PDF, even if it's image, even more so if there are images, it's very, very difficult. And you want to make people be able to uh, copy some of the source code that you have provided as an example in the PDF into their command line or to copy it in their, in their <coughs> sorry, my bad, into their, um, um, Source, source code so they can use that as an example as part of their own source code. And of course, uh, provide the installation instructions, make them as human as possible. So use them stepwise, don't jump steps. If you're requiring someone to have some complex step uh, there, don't just uh, shut it off, just write it as, as you would like to see it. It's so writing it for humans. Um, if you, and if you sometimes, um, 
use generated documentation it's useful to 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 place it there as complement complementary but it doesn't replace uh, things that are written by humans because um, sometimes you might want more detailed explanation of what's happening there uh, i know there are some tools that generate uh, documentation from code however they're not really um, they're not telling of what's happening there and of course uh, at the end of it uh, make the license explicit because I'm just pointing at the top that the license is mit or apache or GNU, uh, gpl or G and gpl uh, it's not enough you need to make it explicit in some point in the documentation that, uh, what the license is about i think this this came out as a requirement because it's not enough to just have it uh, at the repository level you need to have it in documentation as well and of course if people contributed make make them uh, list them in the in your repository to summarize it's in the uh, doc documentation checklist would be a purpose authors license uh, citations uh, how to cite, cite it uh, copy pasteable examples to get started uh, dependencies are on our other um, projects or other packages uh, installation instructions um, how to ask questions how for example if you want people to address uh, issues in a certain way you give uh, provide examples how to do so uh, frequent address some frequently asked questions and of course uh, have a contribution guide at the end I think some of these are actually part of um, GitHub. Uh, they provide some examples, some good templates uh, how to get started. And I think GitLab does it well, does as well, but I might be wrong on that. Okay, any questions so far in the Hackpad HackMD that we need to address? Hopefully we got you at least uh, partly motivated about having good documentation. Okay, I don't see. I see questions about Conda, but not about documentation. So uh, we can move on, I assume. So we're going to go to the next part of the lesson, which is some popular tools and solutions. So what are some of the actual tools out there um, or some ways of writing documentation in the, uh, in the, about your repository? So think of how you're doing it in your group and see if some of these points actually um, relate to your projects, your, your research group or your overall work. So some people the documentation on different levels uh, for example one of the lowest level you can do documentation is attaching it to the source code and this is this is fine this is nice um, i do it as well uh, i think many people do it but um, there's one particular disadvantage of it if you have documentation in source code as we've seen with the published repositories, it's not easy to tell what's happening in that project or what that project is about, how to do installation instruction and so on and so forth. But on the positive side, it's very good because it's, it's, you can sometimes have a documentation to come back in when you're looking to the source code. It's, um, it's version controlled. And of course it can be used for by, auto, uh, automat uh, by tools that automatically generate documentation if you structure them properly if you just use comments in the source code that might not be enough for some for some programming languages and of course some programming languages require a specific way to format uh, the comments in order to automatic automatically generate them uh, but this is the lowest level you can do documentation on of course there's the mm, level that is used by uh, most of the people which is uh, readme in the main in the root directory of the repository the good advantage is of course it's versioned with the repository if you're using git to track the changes um, and it's often enough 
because most people would just look at the that readme in order to to get a sense of what's happening in the repository. Um, sometimes users, uh, well, unless you're using a GitHub or a GitLab uh, in the browser, it's difficult to, to read them in, in, or you need to use the terminal to actually read what's happening inside them. Um, and it's best if you're using these kind of these kind of uh, readmes to use standard formatting. Don't just insert their HTML and expect people to to browse it uh, easily. Uh, even though it might be rendered properly in the, uh, by certain uh, tools or by certain uh, uh, repositories like GitHub or GitLab, it it might be very verbose in terms of uh, text, and it's very difficult to to follow even in the terminal. Um, I think one other good example or bad example, depending on how you look at it, about documentation is our wikis. Wikis are popular to, are popular to use. They're at our disposal. Wikipedia uses it. Um, I think you have one in your organization. Uh, I know we have several in our organization. Um, and uh, they're really, really uh, too easy to use because it's they provide an editor in the browser and they're easy to do changes to generate PDFs and to structure tables and it's a low hanging fruit because it's there. Uh, the often the diffi difficulty with that is that the fact that uh, they um, they're not attached to the source code repository. So if you're pointing to from your source code to that wiki, it's it's kind of difficult to, to note what version of the code uh, um, corresponds to what version of the the, the readme in the wiki. Um, it's and it's typically uh, isolated from from the source code. Even more so if your uh, wiki is behind as on uh, a firewall firewall were um, not publicly available. So, and for people to, to access and see and uh, refer to it. Of course, there's, an, there's the scientific way also, which is the LaTeX um, PDF way. Uh, it's popular among many, uh, many people that you do documentation about repositories because it's also a low-hanging fruit as the wikis. It's easy to do. Sometimes you do it as part of your research paper, or your, um, or it's it's familiar to you. And I know I did it. Um, the only bad part is that it's, um, for example, um, sometimes it's not attached to the repository, and it's difficult to. Uh, automate building the documentation with the source code. Um, it's not impossible, but it is difficult. Um, it, you can keep it in sync with the repository, so you can keep your Lacquer document there, but then again, you have a, plenty of files and um, that need to generate LaTeX template in order to make it uh, happen uh, in order to keep it in sync with the repository. And it's way more complex. Uh, it's a steeper learning curve for people that just want to contribute to it than, or have no familiarity with uh, LaTeX then using uh, Markdown or Restructured Text Index. Um, there's, now we're jumping into the automatic, uh, automatically generated um, documentation, which one of the tool is Doxygen. I'm not sure if people use that um, or are familiar with that. Personally, I'm not familiar, uh, but I know it has support to generate documentation from, from multiple programming languages. If you're familiar with it, just write it in the HackMD and tell us some of your experience or good parts uh, and bad parts of it. I would love to, to read on them. And of course, it, um, it provides some trait out of the box functionality like uh, directly documented your source code uh, can be deployed on any kind of uh, repository from GitHub to Bitbucket and GitLab. And can also be used to generate it, the so-called human kind of documentation, not just uh, source code based. 
And now we're jumping to the, to the last part, which is the restructured text and markdown. Um, uh, which we talked so much about. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with restructured text or markdown or both. Um, but they tend, they, the main advantage of them and why we, uh, we emphasize them in this documentation uh, lesson is because they provide their lightweight markup language. So, so for example, if you use the HackMD, you, I think it was not such a steep learning curve to just start uh, click edi editing and just start using the, and inserting your bullet points here uh, to, the, to the document. So it was quite intuitive to use. Of course, there's, there's some specific format that you need to take into account, uh, but it can be, it can be easier to, uh, it's, it's uh, easier to start than just using LaTeX or just learning how to uh, generate PDFs from, or just using DocX and um, understanding what's behind it. Um, the bad part is that um, there are many flavors of markdown, so it's differ from uh, slightly between themselves. Um, and if you try to, for example, to use both, there are some differences, uh, or to try to switch between both restructured text and markdown, there are some differences between them, and we highlighted them here. Like for example, in order to point to a section, Markdown uses this uh, hash symbols while uh, our restructured text underlines uh, using specific uh, uh, characters, uh, certain sections. And code blocks are different. Lists tend to be the same because there's so many ways you can write a list. The only advantage and disadvantage in restructured text, sometimes there's a need for uh, extra space here between the list to make it renderable and certain uh, automatically generated tools like Sphinx. You might need to do a new line between the list and the paragraph. Um, the good part is that there are plenty of tools out there that you can um, use to learn these syntaxes and we'll experience uh, them ourselves in when in the Sphinx um, part of the lesson. And additionally to using these uh, this uh, syntaxes, you can use them with um, certain generators, um, certain HTML static generator tools like Sphinx, Jekyll, um, Package Down, Markdown Docs, Gitbook, Hugo, Hexo, and so forth. And of course, as I mentioned, GitLab, GitHub, and Bitbucket can uh, generate um, nicer um, formatted doc documentation just by um, having this uh, syntax available. Uh, let's do it like this. Let's um, do this lesson and then do a small break. And um, I think there are two exercises here in this lesson. Um, and we'll try to do the first one type along. So it's good to, to have some sort of, uh, to prepare your command line and to, um, and to see if you can type along or to follow if you would just like to follow at first. So it's gonna be a type along exercise. I'm gonna give you one or two minutes to prepare your consoles and we're not gonna jump um, into this. We're gonna do the first parts. So I just are just starting this and explaining what's happening there and then we can, uh, you can uh, do the rest of the exercises in groups. I think we can leave 15 minutes for them. Uh, okay, so we mentioned about uh, Sphinx. That's it's a pop, it's one of the tools, and I'm personally using, and a lot of us are using, and it's a 
a popular tool out there. It's not the popular tool or the most popular tool out there, but it's a nice to use tool for jointing documentation. Um, and even more so, if we're showing the examples on Python, but Sphinx works with other programming languages as well. It works with R. Uh, I think it works with, um, not sure if it works with Golang, but it works with other prog programming languages as well. And it can be used independently, independently of uh, uh, the programming language you're, you're currently using. And our goal with this lesson is to make our documentation pretty, or to insert some eye candy to the to the um, documentation, and show you how you can keep your documentation in sync with the code. Um, and if you have any questions, please write them in there in your hack HackMD. I'm gonna switch to console right now. And I'm gonna pull up also my lesson here. So I already made a repository. And currently I'm, it's empty. I don't have anything here, um, but we need to check the Python version. You can do this by writing Python, Python minus version. I have 3.7.7. Um, which is the version I'm currently using. And we need to check if we have Sphinx installed. How do we do this? So you write Python minus C, then in quotes, you start import Sphinx. Then um, semicolon, then print, then Sphinx dot underscore version. Then we close the parentheses and we close the quotes. What this would do is tell Python to import a package called Sphinx, then use the print function to print from the Sphinx package the version. And it prints it uh, 3.0.4. I can do the same thing by writing Python, and this will pull, um, pull out the um, Python shell. And I can do in the shell import Sphinx. Then from Sphinx I print Sphinx version. And it shows me 3.0.4. If you don't have this, or if this errors at any point in time, this um, this command. That means you don't have Sphinx installed. How do you go about fixing this? So you do pip, use Python package manager and install Sphinx. And then you try to in install it. For me, it will just say I already have it installed and try to install the dependencies, but I already have it installed. So it, and ultimately it does nothing but that's how you should uh, install Sphinx if you don't have it already. Another package that we require to do this exercise is the Sphinx read a docs team, because we're gonna use our documentation to publish later on on uh, read a docs, which is one popular tool. So we're gonna- Question apply. from chat, can you show the last command? Actually, the commands are in the workshop webpage. Yes, yes, so in the, and uh, I'm following these commands. Uh, Python minus minus version, Python minus C there. And I don't think there is the pip installed here. So probably should add it. The last command was pip install Sphinx. This is how you install the Sphinx package in your uh, Python environment. Uh, but uh, just comment there, we, we assume that most participants have installed Anaconda, so they have it already available. So no, okay. normally no pip install needed for most participants. Yes, I'm using a different shell, so for me it's it is required. But um, just so you know how you install it, and of course, if we need read the docs team, and we can do the same. To Python. I'm not sure. Does the conda provide read the docs team, or you have to install it? Uh, depends, but uh, for those who have conda, they instead of doing pip install. 
they can do conda install. Conda installs things RTBV. Okay. So if you have conda, do conda install uh, Sphinx RTD team. So what I'm checking right now is if I have redo docs team. So I do the same. I check for a specific package, Python minus C quotes, then import Sphinx underscore RTD, which stands for redo docs, and then team. After which I close the, the quotes. And apparently I have it. So if this command doesn't error, that means you can successfully run this uh, import. If you don't have it, you do either pip or conda install and sphinx underscore rtd and then team. And this for me, it should uh, do nothing, but uh, because I already have it, so, yeah, but this is what the command I, last command I wrote, pip install sphinx on TDT. Okay, hopefully if there are some uh, struggles, let us know so we can uh, address them. Now, one last thing to check is if we have sphinx. Uh, so if we can use the sphinx quick start tool. And to do this, we can do sphinx minus or dash quick start minus minus version. And it should correspond uh, to some degree with uh, the sphinx version you have installed. If you have an older version, that's okay. Um, however, there's a slight difference between 1.5 something and 2.0 um, entry. So if you have a version that is older than uh, two, um, there might be slighter differences and um, just so you know, there might be slight differences. I don't think there's a big changes from 2.0 to 3.0 in terms of installation or uses of uh, the quick start. Okay, I'm gonna clear my screen. So I'm gonna press Control L and I'm gonna hopefully everybody, uh, if not, if there are any troubles with the installations, let us know so we can address them. Okay, I see. Um, so we're gonna create a new directory. So make dear doc example. Uh, then I'm going to go into that example directory. So I'm going to cd and then press uh, doc example and tab to go there. And I'm going to use the Sphinx quick start. So what Sphinx quick start does um, is basically initializes a do um, the current repository, which I used with uh, the documentation with the, with the with the structure I need for generating documentation and for publishing my documentation as uh, HTML. So if you just run Sphinx minus quick start, uh, you will be asked a series of questions. Uh, I think we already uh, suggest what to point to those questions. So we're gonna do uh, enter to the first one, then we're gonna name our project, just name it, uh, test as you wish, test project and author. I'm going to be Stefan for now. And the project release here, you can use usually use numbers as release versions. So I'm going to do a 0 0.0.1. So I'm going to use the first version and then the project language usually by default is English, but if you want to set it something else, um, then you can. And I'm gonna hit return or enter to this as well. And this uh, created a series of files. It even tells you what exactly has happened in the repository. It created a conf.py, an index RST, and um, a makefile and a makefile.mat. And we can see this, I'm gonna clear a bit the screen. Uh, with control L and I'm gonna list what's happening in here 
in terms of files. So we see it created more than it just said. It also created the build directory, um, cough.py, which is used for configuration uh, specific to the Sphinx uh, documentation, index.rst, which is the main for on the main file that it will uh, you will see when um, we generate the documentation. So it'll be like the index HTML or the root um, from a website. Then make bat and make file are. Um, if there's you, a question in HackMD: separate yes. source and build directories. Yes or no? Separate source, source or build directories. No, I think so. I think that's the recommendation we, we, there's an answer there. Usually in practice, you would want to do it. So you will do it in a docs folder. Um, but if for this example, I think we just pressed, we use the default, which is no. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and in it's, templates are the uh, are the templates you can use for journey documentation. Static is where you usually place the cascading style sheets or images, uh, which you uh, can use throughout the project or in your documentation. The build is where the actual where the actual HTML or PDF, because things you can also generate PDFs uh, are being used, and. Um, I was telling you about make bat and make file. If you're experienced, uh, if you have some experience with um, make files or C++, uh, this is used to build the documentation using make commands. Uh, we can, we don't need to use it, but you can uh, use them as well. Now, um, I think in the interest of time, we can uh, uh, move into to doing the the group exercise uh, together uh, in uh, or the, the rest of the exercise and exercise two together and uh, for 20 minutes if that sounds okay and then we come back and we uh, proceed with the well we do a small break and proceed with the uh, reader docs um, so to the background to the stream viewers we're in the, um, this part of the lesson where we're Sphinx and restructured text. Uh, it will be nice if you do this two exercises and try to uh, try to figure out how to work with the Sphinx and RST syntax and see how it goes. Also, this tool uh, XDG Open. I think it's a bit deprecated. And uh, if you encounter some uh, some uh, issues with it, uh, it will look something like. Um, so I'm sharing my screen. It will look something like uh, XDG open. So if you try to XDG open and then build uh, HTML, I don't think I built yet. Have I? No, I have not built yet. So we need to first build the documentation. And I think that was done. You can do that with make HTML. I think that was one of the commands that you can use for making documentation. Um, or you could use Sphinx um, build dot and underscore, which is the build directory, which is built. And if you want to open documentation, you can do XDG open and then build, uh, this build HTML. And now there is a HTML there, but we can do it. There's no HTML directory, it's just index there. And this will open the browser theoretically. It should open. So we're going to break escape, then column and WQ to save. And then we need to build again. So 
we're going to do Sphinx build dot. And then we can open it again with GIO open and then uh, underscore build slash index.html or we can just go to the browser and click refresh and we should see welcome to my project. This is what Sphinx looks like in when generated and just to get understanding uh, what's happening uh, how this came to be is Sphinx puts together has some functionality put together. Uh, for example, searching for navigation uh, for structuring the content and it translates what someone writes in, sorry, restructured text syntax into HTML. And of course you can customize uh, uh, most of the, or most of the parts of the, repo of the repository can add your own templates. You can add additional pages. So in order to do more pages, you just need to create a new page. And I'm gonna create a new page. I'm gonna name it feature demo.rst. And I will just start writing something it, into it. So I'm going to press I to insert demo feature. And I'm going to make this a title. And feature contains. And I'm going to make a list. So item one and item two. Press escape column and WQ to save. Then in order to make that visible, um, or we can try to build. So let's see what Sphinx build says to us. Sphinx build dot and underscore build. So what Sphinx tells us right now is that um, the document isn't included in any doc tree. Uh, that that's okay. I think I'll still render it, but it, it's ideal to put it in the documentation, in the documentation or in a, a table of contents. How do we do this? So we'll go to the main page, which is index.rst. So we try to edit it. And we already see a talk tree section here, uh, which is table of contents. And we try to insert something into it. So we're going to name it. Um, the syntax goes like this. So first you write a name, which is demo feature. And then you write the page name, which is feature demo. Hopefully I got the syntax, the syntax okay. So let's press escape, WQ to save. And then let's try to build again. So it's Sphinx dash build dot which represents the query directory and then build. Now there's no more errors, but let's see what happened in the, in the web page. So let's refresh. So it has some contents appeared and the demo feature. And if we go to it, we see our page, which you just created. Okay. And of course you can experiment with the Sphinx syntax in, the, um, in here. There are multiple ways of adding source code, um, structuring the content with different levels of indentation. Um, for example, if you want to write some source code, you need to specify what kind of code block you're using. If you want to include files, there's literal include, which which can include a file. You can even specify port portions of the file to include. 
And of course, there are um, extensions that you can write your own lab tech equations uh, to this, uh, to Sphinx. Um, in the lesson, we saw hopefully experimented with Sphinx and restructured text syntax. Um, now we want to see how to deploy the Sphinx documentation to read the docs. Um, for this, why we would want to deploy the documentation to read the docs? Well, mostly um, it is because you want the documentation to be publicly accessible even though if it's in a repository, you want to reference it with a URL, uniquely identifiable URL. Um, the normal workflow of this is you have a Git repository where you do certain commits, certain uh, you do Git push, um, you add your changes, so on and so forth. And there's some, some tool that watches these changes. And upon each uh, Git push, it receiver it triggers um, a change or generation of the documentation. How it does this? It basically does the same thing as we did in the command line. It does a Sphinx build, and it takes the repository that has been built and puts it at puts it at this at a specific URL. And of course, you can version the documentation there. You can. Uh, publish HTML, PDF, and I think at some point it even offer LaTeX. Um, and the advantage is that the, it's tied to your repository and even if you move it, you can just point it to a different repository and get your, um, still, get a, uh, still get the URL and reference it, uh, the documentation. And you can also reference uh, your custom domain name. For this exercise, is going to be a mostly a show, a show and tell rather than uh, type along. And we're going to use an example project, and we're going to do we're going to go to this. Uh, sorry, I'm going we're going to go to this word count. So step one, we're going to go to the word count project template. We're going to click on this URL. And this is going to appear. So, Stefan, uh, so just to be clear for everybody, here we are supposed to only watch, right? We yes, are only watch. To, to yes, they're not learning. expecting to do okay. it, only watch. Just uh, watch me do it. I'll try to do it as uh, slowly as possible. So, step one is go to the work count, to, this, uh, to the lesson, and to go to the work count project template. Um, it's under code refinery work count. Work count. Instead, instead, uh, if you're wondering where it is, it has a URL here. And I'm gonna put it under my name and GitHub. So I'm already logged in into GitHub and I'm gonna name it Octo uh, Word Count. I'm gonna give it a name because like this, because I lack inspiration. I'm gonna make it public. Uh, I'm not gonna include all, all branches for now and I'm just going to click repository from template. What it does is copies, it creates a um, repository that was generated from this work count uh, repo. Now, this is nice. It has work count an example, uh, and it even has a doc folder here to uh, for documentation uh, to be generated with Sphinx. It has the configuration, the index RST. It doesn't have the build directory because that's only needed if you build documentation. And it's not a good idea to include it, uh, to track it with the repository changes because this should be generated with every documentation and to track it like that, um, it's not a good idea. Uh, mostly because you will see a lot of changes and those changes are not tied to the actual documentation because documentation is in the restructured text documents. So we clone the repository, we can build, uh, we can uh, to our namespace and then we can clone the repository locally. So I'm just gonna do that. So I'm gonna take this clone. I'm gonna copy this URL, go to my command line go one directory up, cd uh, two dots, 
and I'm going to do git clone and I paste the URL. So I'm going to go into that repository. It should be named octo word count. So there I can um, list what's happening there in the repository. So we have all the folders there. We're going to build the doc folder. How are we going to do that? Hopefully I can um, do this properly without looking at the command. So let's fix build uh, doc. And we're going to do doc. Uh, Built. So we're going to generate. We're take, going to take the doc uh, directory, and we're going to gener generate the or the output into the build directory under doc. So hopefully this work all will find, and it says the pay and the pages are in doc slash build. So let's open this and see what's happening there. So I'm going to use the gio command. Gio open doc score build. Uh, I'm going to press a tab to see what's happening there. And if the folders and I'm going to use the index not HTML. Well, this will open the browser, the document in the browser, the generated HTML in the browser. And we see that it generated it open document the generated documentation in the browser, which is nice with the documentation here, you can see it's locally. So if I want to share this nice I can nice I can nice UI, which has a lot of eye candy, it's it's quite difficult to share with someone unless I just share the repository. And uh, but the repository we saw it's very difficult to browse. It's it's and it's not ideal to, for sharing. So I want to do this is publish on read the docs, which means I'll need to proceed with step number two. We're going to enable the project on read the docs. For this, you need to go to readthedocs.org and you need to sign with your GitHub account. So for this, I'm going to just going to log out, demonstrate how it goes, and I'm going to sign out and I'm going to log in again with my GitHub. So it should have in the, sorry, in the Read the Docs page, you should, if you're not logged in already, you should have a login button here and, um, or sign up and you can sign in with your GitHub account. So I'm going to do just that because I already linked my GitHub account with read the docs. And in the projects, uh, I think first it should appear um, something like this. But if it doesn't, uh, that's okay. I have more projects here. What we're going to do is import a project. So we're going to import that specific project to us. Because I have more organizations here, I'm just going to filter repository by my own name on the just clicking on it. So I'm going to look for that specific uh, name here. I don't particularly see it, which is uh, not ideal. So I'm going to just press this refresh button. Hopefully it will show it after the refresh happened. This takes quite a while. Yeah, you may need to reload the page then. Sometimes it, it hangs. Just oh, refreshes no. and then hopefully it shows up now. Um, well, the filter is broken as well, but <laughs> this is not um, very, very ideal. Um, let me try to refresh again, or I can just try to import manually. That will be, I think, easier. So I'm going to use this URL and I'm going to point it to this URL and name the repository octo word count. Be okay, careful the, URL, the name is, uh, is specific. The, Go ahead. The, the URL needs to be a full one then with HTTPS and GitHub and everything. Is it there? I think it is. Oh, it is there. Okay. It is. Yes. So I just copied the URL from uh, the browser uh, bar. So it needs to be, if you're using this, it will not work with the Git. You should be using HTTPS uh, from here, this button. But just copy it from, go to your repository and just copy the URL from the browser there. 
the name is important because it should be unique. If you're using all using the same name, it will break. For some of you who are first will work, for some of you that are following will, will not work. So probably use it and name it with your own user username account if you want to follow along. So I'm gonna name it like this first. This name is gonna be used to identify it in the URL. And I'm already created, so that's nice. And let's see what's happening. There's a way to see what's happening, what Read the Docs does in under builds. Um, it tries to build a specific version, which is the one that is in the main repository. And if you go more into it, it will tell you what is actually happening in that repository, in that repository, in that in that build process. And we're waiting for this to finish successfully, hopefully. And let's see, still building. You should be able to see the docs um, at that at a specific URL, which we'll find out by going to overview. And you should see the short URLs here, which is octo word count blank dots, which is the name I gave to that repository. And if I click on it, or just go to the page and click view the docs, you should be able to see exactly what you have, what we built in the command line. And uh, quickly, if we want to make some changes, we can just um, edit into doc uh, index.rst. So I'm gonna use Vim to edit it. Uh, Vim doc index RST because it's the closest one. And I'm gonna insert something in here. Press I to insert uh, some. I did press escape, then column and W, Q to save. Uh, after which I need to uh, add the changes. So I'm gonna add doc index RST. I'm gonna commit the message. Demo change, git commit minus m and demo change. And then I'm gonna git push uh, the changes to the master. The change um, should have been pushed to the repo. So I'm gonna refresh this and I should be able to see two commits and my commit name, which is demo change. And if we go to the um, read the docs, we should be able to see in under builds, we should be able to see installing a new version. And once this is done, you can um, uh, see the docs updating uh, at that URL. This should go a bit faster because it's not uh, building from scratch again. Hopefully anytime soon. Passed, so it says passed and the build completed. So if I click view the docs again, it will not show it because I need to refresh. So I'm gonna refresh the page and um, it shows up some demo I did. So it shows up the changes directly from our GitHub repository to our read the docs. And this is one way of keeping documentation in sync with the code and making it publicly accessible to, for everyone. You should be able to see that you have specific versions you can activate. So if you have uh, multiple branches, you can activate multiple branches, or if you have uh, specific tags, the tags will show here in the versions. So you can activate them and make them part of your documentation so people can browse different versions of your documentation. And of course, I suggest browsing into admin and looking at more advanced features that Read the Docs have to, have to offer. And I think this concludes the, this part of the lesson. Any questions to address so far? I think one important part to notice is that Read the Docs 
the build directly should not be added as part of the documentation because it's this generated documentation. Uh, so whatever is generated should not be, be part of the tracking of that repository. Well, if not, then I suggest we spend, um, all, um, we're gonna skip this lesson as we, as we don't have enough time, but you, I suggest you follow it on your own. Um, hosting websites and homepages on GitHub pages, and we're gonna go to discussion after the exercise. So here we're gonna use the HackMD uh, to write your questions about documentation. Any other ideas? I saw some really good uh, things there. Someone using Rust docs. I see some of people using text syntax. So restruct, uh, uh, the formats where you, we showed in this lesson are not that far off. Um, what is your opinion? Read me Markdown or re restructured text. Um, what is your opinion on Sphinx or GitHub uh, pages if you have any experience with that or both? And just bear in mind, this is one of the solutions we showed to work, to work with documentation. It is not the only solution. It is one of the solutions we show we, um, for generating documentation. If Stefan is still here, there was a question in chat whether you could show the terminal a few seconds again. But maybe, maybe on a break. Just a second. No, no, no. I'm yeah. I was um, I'm focused on the screen, so I can share my terminal again if that's okay. So, um, is it okay if I stop screen sharing? Sure, I will stop. Okay. Uh, share. Um, Yes, what is it that I should show? So, git status. So what I did here is going up is I uh, built the documentation from uh, Sphinx build using the doc folder, because I know the doc folder is what holds the documentation. And I build it in specifically in doc, on the, uh, doc underscore build. Then I use GIO open, because it's the new tool from, uh, for opening on Linux, for opening documents on Linux. And then I use Vim to make changes to the um, to documentation. Then I added the changes to, the, to Git to track them. Um, after this, I did a commit to, to for the demo for the for that change, and I pushed. And this tracked on master. Is this okay enough? Okay, is it time to start? Sure. I hope everyone uh, has had some coffee or stretched their legs or gotten that last answer to your last question. So we have one hour now for Jupiter. Uh, if you click this link here in the schedule, you get to the lesson material. But before we start, I would like to ask you by answering yes or no in the chat, whether you are already using Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab. So answer yes or no with uh, reactions. It's roughly 50-50 so far. Majority yes. Okay. That's interesting to see. Thank you. So th around 33 people said yes, 20 said no. Um, so I will still be starting from the basics, but hopefully everyone will learn something interesting. And particularly we will focus on how Jupyter Notebooks fit into this landscape of reproducible research. 
but I will start with motivating Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, and then go into the basics, but then uh, show, show some use cases and, and how notebooks can be used to make your work more reproducible. So let me go into the first motivation part. Um, what, is, what is Project Jupyter? It's a spin-off project from IPython, uh, which was split off uh, as an independent project back in 2014, because the idea was to have a language agnostic, all the language agnostic parts of IPython should be moved to Jupyter. And this is reflected in the name, Jupyter derives from Julia plus Python plus R. But uh, these are not the only supported languages. So if you click this link here, you see that there are computational kernels for Jupyter for a lot of different languages here. And why is it called notebooks? Well, when you write a Jupyter notebook, it's sort of like a scientific notebook where you mix text with equations, figures, code. So Jupyter notebooks are a literate programming tool. What does that mean? It, it's, it's just what I said. Um, it's a tool where you can annotate your code. You can write plain text. You can write uh, human readable text, uh, add equations, figures, and so on, creating a computational narrative. And this is uh, a quote from a paper. It's an environment in which users execute code, see what happens, modify and repeat in a kind of iterative conversation between researcher and data. So it's a popular tool in data science, and, uh, but it's useful for a lot of people working with yeah, data or, or for quickly prototyping code. So here are some common use cases, experimenting with new ideas, testing libraries, databases, packages, interactive development environment. Um, it can be used on clusters. It can be used to share and explain code or scientific results with your colleagues or your boss. It's used in teaching. There are lots of notebooks online. You can learn interesting topics. Uh, people use it sometimes to track interactive sessions, computational sessions. I want to highlight this part here, supplementary information with published articles. You can publish a notebook as a supplementary material to make your work more reproducible. Notebooks become slightly less useful if you have large or uh, quite a lot less useful for large code bases. So at some point, if a project is growing, you should probably migrate away from Jupyter into just plain source files and maybe your favorite code editor or IDE. Uh, they're difficult to automate, uh, to test automatically, like we'll learn about tomorrow. And as we'll see, um, there's this funny aspect of notebooks that they can be executed out of order. And we'll discuss some other pitfalls later. To get a flavor, those of you who are new to notebooks, perhaps, uh, there are some two case examples here, inspiring examples of how notebooks are used in exciting research. So there's this uh, activity inequality study from some years ago where people tracked uh, mobile phone data to see how much people walked every day and tried to correlate that with health metrics. And of course, the gravitational wave discovery. If I click this link here, we get to a page with a lot of links to, to data and uh, source code that you can use to play around with uh, raw data itself, which was used to publish that spectacular um, gravitational wave uh, publication. And what they have here, I'll cl click this uh, GitHub link here. Uh, they have, this is one of the many notebooks you can play around with. Uh, this is just to acquaint yourself with the data. Um, so you see this is a GitHub repository with a readme and a IPI and B file. This is a notebook. And if you scroll down, you see that there's some button here, launch binder. If I click this button now, what happens? So something is happening here on mybinder.org. It's actually, it's an online service, uh, free, which can be used to run notebooks in the cloud. You don't even have to install Jupyter on your uh, computer in order to 
play around with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and we'll see actually how we can do this with our own repositories later on. It's launching something here. So how do you think if we have a look at the notebook just for a second? The notebook is launching as well. Okay, we see it here. Uh, this is a Jupyter notebook. You see that it's importing some packages here importing map.lib. How does this cloud instance know what is needed? So I can run this cell and it seems to be executing just fine. It manages to import these packages. Well, I'll tell you the answer. The repository includes a requirements.txt file, which we learned about yesterday. So my binder actually installs all the packages needed, uh, which are specified in this file here. So this is a nice reproducible piece of uh, research, it seems. Okay, it's, this is to give you a flavor, a little bit of uh, motivation maybe to start looking at this. If you wanna see other interesting notebooks, there's a link here to, I don't know, hundreds of different notebooks from different dis scientific disciplines. Let me now switch to the next, <clears throat> next uh, episode. And so I mentioned, the Jupyter project, Jupyter Lab is sort of the, the next generation interface uh, to work with Jupyter Notebooks. People usually uh, earlier were using the, the conventional Jupyter Notebook web interface, but more and more people are now moving to Jupyter Lab, which is more modular, more customizable, more powerful than the traditional notebook format. How does this work? Uh, I'll jump over to a terminal here. So you should all be typing along now. I will create a new directory now. So make sure to jump out of any Git repositories you might uh, have created. So make sure that you're not in a Git repository and let us create a new directory and step into it. And if everything went as it should, for you to, when you install Jupyter, you should be able to run this Jupyter lab command now. If I hit enter, what happens? Something's running and a new tab is opening in my browser. So Jupyter lab and Jupyter notebooks are in the browser. Why did this project go for the browser? Why not a separate uh, graphical user interface? Well, everyone has a browser, uh, all operating systems and browsers have great support for various types of media, sound, videos, pictures, fonts, so on. So it was actually a good idea to use the browser for this, for this tool. Okay, we see the interface now. Uh, here's like a main space where the notebooks go. Here on the left side is, is a, uh, a few um, uh, menus. First one is like a file browser, There's something about running sessions. I now have this Git menu on the left because I installed the JupyterLab hyphen Git extension. This was in the installation instructions. Hopefully some of you installed it. I'll demonstrate later how that works. We have some other things. Uh, I would just want to point out the last one here. If, you have, if you're on a relatively new version of JupyterLab, you should have an extension manager here on the left where you can, you can search for different extensions and install them by clicking here, install. In my case, I have these three uh, extensions already installed, widgets, git, and mbdime. Uh, what do I want to show more? Let's open up in this main window here, in the launcher, let's open up a notebook by clicking Python 3. So these are the kernels I have available on my machine. I could start, start up a Julia notebook or a Python 2 notebook, but I decide to go for Python 3. Here we are. Let me just move my tab to here. What are we looking at? Well, first of all, I want to toggle away this left menu. It's in the way. I don't need to see this. I can press 
command B or control B. Control B on non max. This gives the notebook a little bit more space. Uh, I will jump back to the material just to see what I should show you next. I should focus on the cells. What we're looking at is a notebook and a notebook with one cell. Uh, and if I look up here, I see that this is a code cell. I can switch between different types of cells. I can switch to Markdown. You've all been practicing Markdown by editing the HackMD. So I could now write a title. Let, let's make it a level one heading. Testing notebooks. How do I, how do I execute it? If I press enter, I just go further down in the cell, right? So I could press this play button here, but there's a keyboard shortcut as with everything else in inside Jupyter Lab. I could press shift enter. Shift enter executes the cell. So this markdown I wrote here gets rendered nicely in the notebook. The default type of cell is a code cell. So you see the difference between these two cells here visually in the notebook is that the code cell has this uh, angular uh, square brackets outside. So what I could do now is to write some sort of uh, code. Let's print hello world. I press shift enter to execute it. And you see this was a code cell. It got executed and you, we get a number here. This is to show the execution order of the cells in the notebook. If I do X is equal to one here, it goes up to two. I told you about the out of order execution. I could go up and re-execute this cell here, shift enter. And you see that now I have an out of order execution of the cell. So this, the, the print cell was executed after this one. So this is something to look out for if you're not used to notebooks. It can introduce weird bugs if, if you're not careful. So the best practice is to execute always from top to bottom. Um, yeah, so how, how is the architecture underneath? So when we wrote Jupyter Lab in our terminal, it started a notebook server. The notebook server opened up a, a browser tab in my browser, and that's where we interact with the notebook. At the same time, it manages uh, the file system. It writes to a no notebook file and the computational kernel, so the Python process, which is running. That's how Jupyter is designed. Okay, markdown cells, I told you about those. Everything is supported here. I can just copy paste something for fun. F feel free to type along, but no pressure. There, there will be ample time later to, uh, to play around yourself. I'm demonstrating things. Let's say I copy paste this here now and I click shift enter. Oops, error. What did I do wrong? I forgot to change the type of cell, right? So this was a code cell and this makes no sense. This is not valid Python syntax. So I go to markdown, I have to pick markdown. If I click shift enter, now it gets shown correctly. I just want to bring your attention to a few more keyboard shortcuts. Uh, it's a bit inconvenient maybe to be using your mouse and clicking all the time. And there are keyboard shortcuts for almost everything inside Jupyter Lab. So uh, oops, uh, to switch between code and markdown, you can press M for markdown and Y for code. M, Y. There's one thing I didn't really tell you either, which is now you see it's a bit different when I'm inside the cell here, right? Now I have a cursor inside the cell, uh, but I cannot, well, yeah. Th and this is called edit mode. If I press shift enter, I get into command mode. Command mode is sort of when you're outside a cell and you can scroll up and down between your, your cells. Okay, command edit modes, keyboard shortcuts. 
I told you about uh, shift or shift enter. There's also control enter, which um, what's the difference? Control enter stays in the same cell. So I can execute this cell as many times as I want. Uh, Alt key enter executes the cell and creates a new cell below it. So there's some nice features here to save your your wrists from uh, using the mouse too much and uh, to save time. You can copy paste cells with C and V, X cuts a cell, D, D deletes a cell, you can undo with Z, A and B insert new cells either above or below the current cell and so on. These are now in, um, in command mode, right? You have to be in command mode at least these below here. Okay, so I will not spend time on this here. There's a discussion point. I just wanna say that Jupyter Lab is sort of like an IDE, uh, inter integrated development environment, but it's, uh, it's only, only for notebooks. Well, in principle, you could actually write code in other uh, outside uh, of a notebook. Maybe I should have said that. So if you, want to open up something new here. Uh, you can go to the left side menu and click the plus icon. And you see that this is what I did before with a different kernel. So I opened up a notebook. You can also open up a console and a text file if you want to write code directly with syntax highlighting. That's possible as well. You can actually open up a terminal. If I click terminal here, It's a full, fully fledged terminal where I can, uh, yeah, do everything I can do in a normal terminal. I also wanted to highlight one thing. So I told you that the interface is rather customizable and, and modular. So it's quite nice that I can sort of make it look any way I want. I can, maybe I want to have a terminal down here and a notebook up here. But for now I'll close this terminal and I want to toggle the left side menu with command B or command B or control B. All right. Yeah, people dif prefer different tools to write code, but uh, JupyterLab is, is a great tool for notebooks, of course. One challenge with notebooks, at least earlier, was that they were difficult to um, version control nicely with Git because they're stored in these IPYNB format, which is JSON. And JSON is very verbose. It has lots of metadata as well. And when you did, when people did git diff and so on before, it gave a lot of jargon in the terminal. But fortunately, many nice plugins have been developed. So jupyterlab-git is the one I have installed. And so the situation is actually a lot better nowadays. I will demonstrate in a minute how, how that works. Uh, there's also a Git menu here at the top. I can actually do a Git init and I can clone and I can open a Git repository in a terminal. I'll show that in a minute. Okay, that concludes this part. Um, let's jump to the next section. if there are any urgent problems that need attention from the chat. There are kernels in both MATLAB and C++. Yeah, yeah, kernels for many different languages are as well. Okay, so let, let's get our hands dirty now with sort of, uh, well, for some of you, this might be uh, uh, something you do every day, but um, for others, this might be new. Let's just get a flavor of, of uh, how notebooks can be used to create a nice story behind your analysis. So we will, we will, ask, we will try to calculate pi using so the irrational number pi by throwing darts. Um, so we will have an algorithm to estimate pi based on uh, Monte Carlo, a random method here. Uh, I'll experiment with something new. I added this just yesterday to the lesson because I, I will be 
copy pasting some code and you, you will do that as well. Um, so instead of jumping between these two tabs now that I have up here, Jupyter Lab and, and my lesson page, I, I will just show a little cute thing here. I will um, enter this text into a new notebook actually. What do I want to do? I want to open up a new notebook. I could go here or like I showed you before with the plus sign and I want a new notebook. And I'll start by naming it. So by default, the notebooks are called untitled.ipynb. Let's rename it. I can do command shift S or control shift S. I'll call it computingpy.ipynb. Uh, what should one do first? It's probably a good idea to always adding a title. Calculating pi using darts. And yeah, what I said here about this cute piece of code here to uh, help us copy paste, I will just paste it here. And what happens? I actually get a web page inside my notebook. It's pretty neat. So this is the lesson web page. I'll click on this third episode. All right, here, here are the instructions. Let's do this together. We have created a new notebook. We named it and we added a heading. Let's write some mathematical background to our analysis here. Um, I will add it here below, oops. Okay, so if you get problems with scrolling, so you see here I'm scrolling the web page, but if I scroll a little bit here on the margin, I actually scroll the, in the notebook itself. I'll also take away this left-hand menu now. So I want to make a markdown cell. Uh, and I need to do that in, uh, in command mode, right? So I need to jump out of this cell into command mode. I can do that by typing, uh, pressing the escape button. Now I'm in command mode. I type M to make it a markdown cell and then enter once more to uh, add, add the text I want. Mathematical background. You see that the math renders nicely here in the notebook. What did I want to do more? You will be able to catch up with this if I'm going too fast. So sorry about that, but uh, we will have an exercise session later where you can all practice. Let's add an image because that's good for creating a computational narrative. Uh, again, I forgot to change to a markdown cell. So escape key, go up here, change to markdown. So this is the algorithm. We will be uh, creating random numbers inside this square and then checking whether the number falls within the unit circle or not. Okay, so now we start writing some code. We import random. Now we want a code cell, import random. Good to import packages at the top. We want to create, uh, define a variable number of points, how many times we will be throwing darts in the unit square. Paste that here. And finally, an algorithm to throw the darts. The code is not important in itself, it's the idea is to build up a, a computational narrative together. So I neglected something. So in a computational narrative, I should of course be adding commentary and texts to explain. This is something you might be ultimately sharing with your colleagues or with your boss or with a community via supplementary information. So let's create a new cell here and uh, make it a markdown cell. 
and yeah, this is completely superfluous in the current case, but we'll do it for demonstration purposes. Import needed packages. I'll just write normal text there, define number of, of darts. Um, throw the darts. Something like that. It's just just an ex just an example. Uh, we now want to plot the results. So that's an, an inherent part of data analysis. We we do the data, uh, the statistics, the the computation, and then we plot the results. We see something unusual here. This is not really Python syntax. This is an extension in uh, which is possible inside Jupyter. Uh, so when a command is, is prefixed by a percentage sign, that means it's a magic command. A magic command sort of enhance the power of notebooks. They add some functionality. I'll talk more about that in a minute. In this case, this percentage sign inline simply defines how the graphs should look inside the notebook. Okay, so we execute uh, a plot, uh, some code here, which creates a plot and the plot is created nicely below. These are all our random points that we calculated above. As you notice, you sometimes end up scrolling a bit up and down in a notebook. That's, I guess, just how life is. I've gotten used to it, I don't know. The final thing, step of our analysis, is to actually compute pi based on uh, how many hits fell within this unit circle. So we need to multiply by four because we're not interested only in a quarter of a circle, but the full circle. So. Final result is here. Let me uh, add some markdown. Final estimate of pi. Shift enter. Okay, it was a crappy estimate of pi, but we can of course improve it by increase the density of the numbers here, of the um, random numbers. All right, so what did we learn? We created a little computational narrative here. And this is a typical use case, I guess. Um, this little feature here by embedding the web page in the, in the notebook, I don't wanna keep it. I'm just gonna delete this cell. How do I do that? I either go to, uh, I can cut it here, but I can also type DD to remove it. I'm going to demonstrate one more thing, which is working with Git from within JupyterLab. So this is in the same uh, episode here where we had the comp computational narrative. I'm just scrolling down to the bottom. Uh, working with Git. If you have time, you can type along, but I'm not expecting, I'm, I'm going a little bit too fast for that perhaps. I want to start version controlling now, tracking this with Git. And I do, I, I will use everything. Of course, I could do this from the terminal as well, but for the sake of demonstration purposes, I will do it from within JupyterLab. Git init, yes, please. I want a new Git repository. I can then go here to my Git menu. And I want to stage my computing Pi notebook. Initial commit of, of computing pi. Here's the commit message. I'll press commit. And I can now see git history here. This is my first commit. I want to set up a remote repository for my, uh, for my experimental uh, repository uh, for my example notebook here. So I go to my GitHub page 
and I want a new repository. Type Jupyter Lab demo. That's not a taken name, so I create a public repository. I already have an existing repository on my laptop, so I don't initialize with a readme. I just create. You know the drill perhaps from last week. What, what do we do? We want to push an existing repository from command line, so we need to execute these commands here. Take this one first. Uh, how shall I do it? I think I'll go again to the Git menu and open this Git repository in a terminal. Let me get rid of this left menu here. Let me perhaps draw it so it's shown below. Here we are. I can now copy paste this uh, uh, git remote add command. And the next step is, this needs to be done in terminal for the first time. The first push needs to be done from a terminal because you need to push with a minus U setting the upstream option. After doing it once in terminal, you can actually do it all using this uh, Git integration. Okay. I'll go back. And I have my notebook here. So if I now, I'll, let's just close this terminal now. I'll add uh, something conclusions. I'll save the notebook. Just added some a section here at the end. I'll go to my Git tab on the left. I can actually see a Git diff if I press this plus minus here next to my next to my notebook. So nothing changed here. This is a git diff inside. Yeah, so whatever I see here on the right are my changes. I'm happy about that. Add section with conclusions, commit. And then now I can use these buttons, git push. This is for pushing, this is for pulling. So I can push my change now. Okay, I just wanted to go through the process. So you see that uh, nowadays Jupyter Lab has a very nice integration with Git. I did push my commit successfully. And I'll drop into the next episode now. Are there any questions coming up in the HackMD which we should address? No. One feedback is that if for those who try to type along and click along, it's really yeah. quick because there is a lot of screen switching and scrolling. Yeah. But the, yes. the feed, what I answered also there is that maybe it's better than to watch it as a demo, show what is possible. And then the steps itself, uh, you can find them then in the material. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry for uh, being fast. And uh, if, if this has um, those of you who, who tried to follow uh, got lost but uh, yeah all i can say is that we have an exercise later and hopefully you'll be able to catch up i want to review these uh, topics here in the episode four extra features shell commands magics and widgets so like any integrated development environment ide there is easy access to help and from within the notebook you could, for example, okay, maybe I should comment on when I'm switching back and forth. So I'm now back in my uh, uh, Jupyter Lab session. I want to take away my git diff output. I just close this one. I could uh, go here up to where I imported the packages add something, add a new cell. I pressed B and I import numpy as np. That went well, I'll 
now show what I was talking about with easy access to help. I could uh, type a, a question mark here in order to get the doc string of this method. So the sum method of NumPy. I could add two question marks if I wanna see the, uh, the source code itself. Okay, I don't want to go spend too much time on this. It's just to show that there is, there are some nice features to uh, become efficient when you run work inside a, a Jupyter Notebook. You also have access to shell commands. Uh, this is a little bit operating system dependent. Um, might not work completely on a, on a Windows machine, I think. Uh, so, but on a Mac, I could in principle, sorry for the scrolling, I could go here to the bottom and say, Echo hello. So this is a shell command and it gets executed within my, my notebook. I can also capture the output. I could, uh, if I copy paste this here, go back here, run it, and then I want to print this list. So this is quite convenient. I can run a shell command and capture its output into a, into a list. Magics, I already mentioned that they are an extension to Jupyter Notebooks. There is sort of a, a meta magic command to list all the available magics, LS magic. Just as we saw above, you can add a question mark to get a help menu. Okay, so we saw shell commands, we saw magics. Another layer of interactivity in notebooks comes from these widgets. Widgets are like even more interactive computing inside the notebook. So uh, I'll keep copy pasting. Let's uh, jump back to the notebook. I'll just copy paste it here at the bottom. I just wanna show the uh, general idea. So I import a method called interact from the IPy widgets package. And then I can use this interact function like so. I, I, I define another Python function, taking three variable variables. And I can use this interact function as a function or this interact method as a function where I provide some uh, values for these variables. Or I can also use interact as a decorator above a function with the at sign. The details are not important. I just wanna show the idea. Copy paste it here. So there's, we have um, controls here now. So we, we could uh, interactively change the value, for example, of X from true to false. We can interactively change the value of Y. It's a floating point number. We can change the value of S, which is a string. And this could, these controls here like this could be continuously updating something. It can be updating a graph, updating some output, updating a numerical value as, as a result of some analysis, which, which gets triggered whenever you change the controls. And there is a little example or exercise on how to do that soon. Okay, so I promised exercises and I want to give you time to do them now. Um, so there are two exercises here, a few useful magic commands. Uh, what are those? Th those are this time it magic here. This is to time the execution of a cell. If you, if you have a magic command with two percentage signs like this, it means it's a cell magic. It should be put at the top of a cell and it influences everything that's in the cell. So if you add this to the top of your cell, the execution time of running that cell gets, uh, gets calculated. Here's a profiling magic. So, okay, you, so the idea here is that you can pick a, a exercise that you want to work on. You can play around with magic commands. You can play around with a widget. This is, uh, what is this? This is to um, 
do our estimating of pi using uh, the random algorithm interactively using a, using a, a widget. So you can play around with that. Gives you an idea of how useful these can be. But in the very next episode here, there's actually a long list of exercises. More about widgets, about profiling, about uh, installing a new magic command, some data analysis with pandas and so on. So of course, this, this is far too much to cover in 20 minutes or even 15, but um, it's just, they're there, they have solutions and you can play around with them later. So I think I want to break up for 15 minutes where you get a chance to play around with Jupyter, do your own stuff or do attempt one of these exercises. So either episode five here with all the exercises or, sorry, or if I go back, episode four here at the bottom. So let's break up for 15 minutes into breakout rooms and uh, get back five minutes before 12. Okay, so uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. There's limited time as usual, but hopefully you could practice at least something. You could um, play around with something. I heard that there were some issues with the widget uh, extension and the Git extension. And we always have some of these issues because um, uh, of course, you first of all, you need to install them. I showed you here earlier the widget extension. If I, this is my Jupyter Lab now. I go to this um, this menu here on the left. I can see that I installed Jupyter Lab widgets slash Jupyter Lab manager extension and the Jupyter Lab slash Git extension. Uh, this should make it work, but of course there can be some issues with configuration. And if anyone wants direct help to solve those problems, you can stay around after the workshop today too. And we can have a look at it together. Uh, okay, so I, I want to wrap up. Um, anyone is free to stay around after 12 o'clock to have a look at any questions you might have. I'll, I just want to show one very important and nice thing here in the last episode, sharing notebooks. So uh, sharing notebooks are for sharing. Uh, they're for sharing analysis with your colleagues and your, for making your research reproducible by others. Uh, for example, by publishing supplementary material. And here are some ways you can collaborate on notebooks and share notebooks. There are platforms like CoCalc and Google Collaboratory and Microsoft Azure notebooks where you can work on notebooks. Uh, but what I want to highlight here is this binder service that I showed you in the beginning with the gravitational wave re, uh, project. So I, I, you can do this exercise at home after the workshop. Um, I already did it. I created a requirements file because my notebook depends on the widgets, NumPy and Matplotlib. I added it to my repository. I then visited my binder here. And what did I do on my binder? I added the URL of my JupyterLab demo repository. What did I do next? I went down here where it says, copy the text below, then paste it into your readme to show a binder batch. I copy pasted it into a readme file and added it to the repository. Uh, where's my repository? Sorry, it's here. Uh, I added it to a readme file and see, I have this button here. I can push, anyone in the world can now push this button and open up my notebook in the cloud and play around interactively with my analysis. So if you do this with your projects, you don't get much more reproducible than that. So that's a nice thing. I recommend that you try this exercise at home and consider doing this with your future projects. I think your colleagues might get impressed and particularly your, your boss. Uh, and then finally, finally, just a few recommendations. Uh, if you run into very, if, you, if your notebooks end up being very, very long, you can create a table of contents at the top. Sometimes it might be interesting to share a notebook without the code, with only the output, only the, uh, numbers and the figures. 
And here's a little trick how to do that. You should add this into a code cell. And final discussion. Um, yeah, I showed you some use cases. Um, not all, people use it for different purposes. There are some pitfalls with notebooks. They don't provide, promote modularity. And, and as I said, a notebook and easily ends up being very long. So at some point, it, it actually makes sense to migrate to modules, to export your code into, if you're writing Python, then write Python files and packages. And th those you can then import into your notebook when they're done. Uh, yeah, notebooks are difficult to test. Uh, well, they can be version controlled, so that's not much of a problem anymore. I mentioned that you can run code out of order. If you run into weird bugs, something completely unexplained, it might be that you executed the cells out of order. Notebooks aren't named by default. You get this untitled name. So uh, good to rename your notebooks early. Okay. So that concludes my session.